Uh, I'm going to we're going to start the session on portal hypertension. It's one of my areas of interest, and I think we've got a great panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, a bunch of people that I work with, and a bunch of people that I trained with, and met along the way that all share this uh, this uh, this subject matter. Uh, we have David Koch from a hepatologist from Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, we have Brett Anderson, an interventional radiologist from Medical uh, University of South Carolina. We have. David Wallman from the University of Rochester, uh, myself, um, Wael Saad from the University of Michigan, and Ken Chavin from the Medical University of South Carolina Transplant. Uh, we're going to start off with medical management of portal hypertension by one of our hepatologists, uh, David Koch. Uh, worked with David for quite a number of years now. I think he trained here and then stayed here, so we've been working together for most of the time that I've been here, and he's a, he's a great asset to us, and we work and collaborate on a number of very difficult patients together, and it's a pleasure to have him here to talk about the medical management of portal hypertension. Thank you, Chris, um, and thank you for asking me to cover about my entire practice in 15 minutes, but what we're going to try to do um, is to go over initial presentation and basic uh, uh, medical and endoscopic management of portal hypertension. Um, in the interest of time, we'll spend much on this. You're mostly aware of the normal vasculature, portal vein that flows into the liver, at the sinusoid, um, it leaves by the hepatic vein to the right atrium. But in cirrhotic patients, <coughs> intravascular, uh, intrahepatic rather, resistance increases due to distortion of the sinusoids from regenerative nodule formation and fibrosis. That generally is one of the major features that drives portal hypertension so that you get collateral circulation forming. Initially, when we see these patients, they have several physical findings. They're yellow, they're swollen, they're confused. Advanced patients with, with severe liver disease often have tremendous muscle wasting. They have interesting findings on in the nails and skin that I'll show you. They may have gynecomastia, um, their liver and spleen are enlarged, um, and they may have the tremor asterixis that goes along with encephalopathy. You'll see here someone with severe temporal and parotid muscle wasting, as well as wasting here in the back where you can see all the bones of the, of the scapula. He also, I don't know if you can see, has a little spider angiomata that we'll see in a second. Um, so more specifically, patients with alcoholic liver disease or sarcoid may have parotid swelling. And here is the spider angiomata that, is, that it develops because of high estrogen, stylate arteriole, that if you um, apply pressure to tamponade will blanch and then fill out from the from the middle outwards. Estrogen also causes pulmonary thema, um, and patients also can have Dupuytren's contraction. What happens in the hands can also happen in the feet. So if they have clubbing from hepatopulmonary syndrome, um, then you can see it on their hands and feet as well. Hepatitis C patients may have cryoglobulinemia, so they can get a leukocytoclastic vasculitis, and you see here the, the palpable purpura on the legs. Almost all patients with ascites have dilated abdominal wall veins. This isn't caput medusa. <clears throat> this here is true caput medusa, where you see dilated veins um, around the umbilicus. So getting now more to cirrhosis, its progression, and portal hypertension, any form of chronic liver disease left untreated will progress to cirrhosis, and initially in a compensated phase, meaning that the patients have had no complications from portal hypertension or liver insufficiency. Over time, if there's no intervention, meaning you're not able to, to treat the chronic liver disease, they will develop these complications. The major ones are variceal bleeding, ascites, encephalopathy, and jaundice. That then classifies them as decompensated cirrhosis, which will progress on to death or transplant. And it's important to identify this state because you can see all patients with, with, with cirrhosis have a median survival of nine years. But once they've developed one of those complications then, and they become decompensated, their median survival then drastically reduces down to about one and a half years. So again, that's when we start to identify patients that we need to evaluate for transplant. But cirrhosis is a vascular disease, and that's why I think it's very pertinent for this audience. Um, the complications mainly occur due to derangements in the vascular system that happen with portal hypertension. <clears throat> the, you get cerebral vasodilation that contributes to encephalopathy in addition to the altered metabolism of ammonia. They get peripheral vasodilation that causes systemic hypotension and alters uh, renal perfusion that causes them to retain sodium and water. They have dilation of the vasculature in the lungs that contributes to the patopulmonary syndrome. A small subset, about 5%, may actually get uh, vasoconstriction and that causes portopulmonary hypertension. And then all patients 
has splenic vasodilation, and you'll see that's one of the other contributions to portal hypertension. So in addition to the clinical findings that identify patients with decompensated liver disease, we have several scores uh, to help determine the severity of child care called Pew score and MELD. Those are the two most commonly used. Specifically, patients who have acute alcoholic hepatitis, there are numerous scores to help identify the most severe ones. And then here on the right, there's a bevy of, sto of scores that we can use to try and estimate fibrosis without going to a liver biopsy. And they're, they're sort of curious and interesting to use, and they're variably helpful, uh, but not as, as accurate as a biopsy. So here you see the child took our pew scores, five variables, three laboratory tests, two physical findings of ascites and encephalopathy. It goes from 5 to 15, and you can break it down into child's class A, B, and C, uh, with each increasing severity of disease. The Mayo Group developed the MEL score, the model of end-stage liver disease. This takes the, the log transformation of INR, bilirubin, and creatinine. Um, it was initially derived to help predict outcomes after TIPS. It then has been used to allocate patients for transplant, which is how we use it now. So there is a UNOS derivation that's slightly different than the Mayo one. You can see here the, the, the numbers in blue, as long as the values are all above one, both formulas would give the same result. But if there is a, a value of, of less than one that you see here in the orange, the UNOS model will be higher than the Mayo one. So it's helpful sometimes to know when you're plugging in the calculator which one is actually being used to give you the result. So quick case, this is how we see these patients. A uh, middle-aged gentleman comes in with, with GI bleeding. Um, he has ascites, he's confused, has no significant medical history other than heavy alcohol use, and he's obtunded, he's hypotensive, tachycardic, um, he's jaundiced. And here you see he's anemic, he has thrombocytopenia, mild coagulopathy, again indicating the fact that he has chronic liver disease. His liver tests here are, are elevated, particularly the bilirubin. Uh, of four, and so he's having an upper GI bleed that you see on the left here is from a variceal uh, bleed. To get to that point, the varices have to enlarge, and you'll see on the right the, the most high-risk varices are the ones that have these little red spots. That's a high-risk stigmata where the variceal wall is thin significantly and is at risk of rupturing. In addition to the size of the varix and the si red signs, the more advanced the liver disease, the greater the chance that they will bleed. So from cirrhosis, the complications happen predominantly from portal hypertension, like I mentioned, varices, ascites, and ascites also can lead to SBP and hepatorenal syndrome. Encephalopathy occurs both from the collateral circulation that develops from portal hypertension, but also from the liver insufficiency from altered ammonia um, uh, metabolism. And finally, jaundice is purely liver insufficiency. Cirrhosis is the most common cause of portal hypertension, but it's not the only one. Um, again, the, the resistance is that the level of the sinusoid and other forms of portal hypertension are classified as to where the problem occurs. So is it prehepatic in the, in the portal vein or splenic vein, pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal or above the liver, um, either post-sinusoidal or outside of the liver it's, uh, entirely. So I mentioned and I showed that the, the sinusoids are altered, that causes increase in, in, in resistance in the liver, but that's not the only reason that you have altered, or you, you have portal hypertension. There's problems with nitric oxide, and I apologize for the arrow overlying the nitric oxide, but with sheer stress, nitric oxide increases, the splenic uh, system vasodilates, so you have increased flow, and pressure is flow times resistance, so that's gonna contribute to the portal hypertension, and then the cycle develops where ascites forms, you get bacterial translocation and greater production of nitric oxide. <clears throat> so you can see here, there's actually, there's three factors that contribute. You have the intrahepatic resistance, increased uh, 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 venous flow, and you also have a hyperdynamic circulation that occurs with, this, with the reduction in vascular resistance and increased um, absorption of sodium in the kidney, um, which is here and is out of, out of order, I apologize. But you see you get vasodilation, retention of sodium, and expansion of the blood volume to this hyperdynamic circulation. So then as the portal pressure worsens, varices get big and they eventually bleed and grow. And you can see this is the progression of patients for the, when we'll see them early on. Initially they have no varices, they'll progress to small ones and then to large at about a rate of seven, eight percent per year. But the worse they have liver disease, the greater the chance of having varices, the, pre the prevalence increases, particularly the development of large varices. 
but it's a threshold effect with portal hypertension and the complications of ascites and variceal bleeding. The hepatic venous pressure gradient, or HVPG, has to be above 12 millimeters of mercury. Below that point, you won't have any of these complications. And you'll see here, this just relates to the fact that small varices don't bleed, but larger ones do. When we see them, our initial intervention to help prevent development of large varices is to give them a non-selective beta blocker that causes flank to vasoconstriction. By doing that, we reduce the collateral blood flow, the variceal wall thickens, so you have decreased wall tension, and therefore that reduces their risk of bleeding. And if we're able to drive that hepatic venous pressure gradient less than 12 millimeters of mercury, they will not bleed. Um, a secondary endpoint is to get at least a 20% reduction in the HVPG, that'll reduce your, your bleeding rate to about 10%. But if the beta blockers have no effect, which occurs in about a third of patients, their rebleeding risk is high at about 50 to 60%. Other options that we have, the beta blockers are actually a vasoconstrictor, like I mentioned, this flank new circulation. You have venodilators, isozobi, mononitrate. The problem is that cirrhotic patients often don't tolerate it because of the hypotension. Endoscopic therapy for active bleeding, and then, as we'll hear later, tips. And here you see what we do endoscopically is a cap is placed on the end of the, of the, of the scope here. The varix is sucked into that cap and a, and a band ligature is placed at the base of the varix. We do that now instead of sclerotherapy. It's more effective, less complications, and improves survival um, by using this modality. You'll see here the rebleeding rate with, with band ligation is much lower than with sclerotherapy on the left. And what's interesting on the right with any endoscopic therapy, you actually have an initial rise in that HVPG when we're doing the procedure. Um, but for whatever reason, there's no explanation. The patients who got sclerotherapy, that the HVPG remained higher, you see on the right, than compared to those who got band ligation, and that may contribute to the rebleeding risk. And I'll end now just with other endoscopic findings that we see with portal hypertension here. Um, this is portal hypertensive gastropathy. You see the mosaic or snakeskin pattern on the left and more severe forms with the erythematous marks on the right. Rarely does this present with overt bleeding. I've only seen one case um, so far uh, where they had overt bleeding from this from portal hypertensive gastropathy and mostly just causes iron deficiency anemia from, from slow occult blood loss. And the last is orgastric varices, and these are much more ominous. Um, we, they're not often amenable to general sclerotherapy or band ligation. You'll unroof the varix and cause massive bleeding. Um, so previously, we sent all of these patients to interventional radiology after we tamponaded them off um, with, a, with a balloon. Now we can inject a cyanoacrylate uh, endermill into the varix that's similar to histocryl, which is used elsewhere in the world but isn't approved by the FDA. So now endoscopically, we can occlude these varices and help um, prevent all of them from going to tips, which is associated with obviously encephalopathy and other potential problems that can occur with that intervention. So in conclusion, the development of the complications of portal hypertension or liver insufficiency indicate that patients have progressed in their liver disease to a decompensated state. Portal hypertension occurs from increased resistance and increased portal flow. Our pharmacologic therapies are aimed to reduce portal hypertension, and our aim is to get the HVPG less than 12 millimeters of mercury, or at least a substantial reduction of 20% from their baseline level. Endoscopically, band ligation is superior to sclerotherapy, um, and we now have options to treat gastric varices in addition to the esophageal ones um, as a complement to the more advanced treatments, which we'll get to now by interventional radiology with TIPS. And I thank you for your time. Um, I said, any, any questions that I can answer for the audience? Correct. Is there any other option right now? Well, carvedilol is the most effective treatment for, uh, for or beta blocker because you get both alpha and beta um, inhibition. The problem is hypotension. You have isosorbi mononitrate, but again, hypotension is a problem. Um, and people are looking at statins uh, because there is a, a, a dynamic um, 
you can affect in the liver where about 25% of the resistance um, and intrahepatic pressure can be reduced by affecting endothelial dysfunction, and that's where statin medications have that effect. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, Dave.